here's C. diff. For whatever reason, it's now allowed to proliferate, whereas prior, it's either been held in check or it's at a rational level. What does the bug do? Does it, I mean, it doesn't just, like a Pac-Man, bite your, bite your gut. I mean, how does, how does it cause disease? So, yeah, so, so once it starts, when, once you're in that C. diff promoting state after antibiotics, it grows, and then as part of the, you know, just the natural um, growth cycle of C. difficile it starts to produce toxins, and, and the two uh, main toxins that, that lead to symptomatic C. difficile infection, the diarrheal disease that we're all familiar with is um, toxin A and toxin B. And, and again, historically what we had been taught is that toxin A was probably the primary mediator, but what we've learned since then is that it's actually toxin B is probably more important than toxin A. Just when you thought it was safe to remember your medicine, yes. they switch it up on you. What do these toxins do? What are they? So the toxins, again, we, we don't know the exact mechanism of what's going on, but essentially what happens is that they bind to receptors on the colonocytes, uh, and exactly what those receptors are, we don't know yet. Um, and then they're internalized, they get released within the uh, colonocyte, and then they start to cleave the cytoskeleton, you get colonocyte death. And then once the toxins hit the submucosa, they're very pro-inflammatory. You get very intense inflammation, and that's you know the, the characteristic pseudomembranous colitis is you get death of a colonocyte, and then some toxin onto that submucosa, and then you get an explosion, a volcano, you know, as we were taught, is, is how it's described in, in pathology of, of inflammation. You know, it's, I'm, you mentioned the pseudomembranous colitis. I can remember when that phrase first popped up you know, back when pterodactyls flew through the air in my hospital. And it was associated with one or two really specific antibiotics, and we were taught those antibiotics cause a membrane. Not true. It's the C. diff, right? Yes, yes. Okay. But, um, there, but uh, there are, let me interrupt you for one second. There, there are two very important things to know about pseudomembranes. One is that it's not uh, specific for C. difficile. You can get pseudomembranes with bacterial infections, viral infections, and also with parasitic infections. And the second thing is, is that uh, if you see patients with recurrent C. difficile, and I'm sure we'll talk about this uh, later, they very unusually have pseudomembranes in their colon. Despite the fact they have C. diff, despite the fact they have diarrhea, they do not have pseudomembranes. And maybe that's because they were treated with antibiotics so much along the way. But then it, I think it's fair, correct me if I'm wrong, to get rid of this whole phrase pseudomembranous colitis as a synonym for C. diff. The two are distinct. You can have membranes without C. diff and C. diff without membranes. You, you can, but about half of all people who are diagnosed with C. diff, if they're scoped, will have pseudomembranes. Okay. Only half, though, not, not 100%. Yeah. No, and I'm, the kind of patient that Eric described is usually the kind of patient we're more accustomed to seeing in the hospital, that patient with a massive systemic inflammatory response, a very high white count that can be 100,000 or in the tens of thousands, not at all unusual. Uh, in the outpatient or ambulatory setting, like Larry was saying, the patient uh, phenotype is a little bit different. It's someone with much milder disease who maybe doesn't have a white count through the roof or these other signs of systemic inflammatory. I want to file that comment away just for a moment. We're going to get right back to it. But this is all trying to I guess, assemble a pattern for recognition in the community. In my hospital, if somebody's in my ICU and the white count's 50,000 and they're having diarrhea, not so hard to at least consider C. diff. But I wanna, I wanna go back and, and examine that later because the physician in the community may have a tougher time. Now, you talked about toxin A, toxin B. You talked about that, that uh, cardiotoxic to toxin. Is that one of those two, or is that a third toxin? No, it's one of those two. Okay. That, that gets into the circulation. And uh, once it gets out of the colon, at least in animal models, uh, it causes a lot of devastation. Mm -hmm. Now we've been does, it do, does it do the same thing? How does it, how does it do that, its devastation? Well, it seems to be able to affect uh, some of the cells in the heart itself. The same way it does the colon? Yes, it causes uh, destruction of the cells. And, um, and we'll find hemorrhage, uh, cardiac hemorrhage, uh, lung hemorrhage, and uh, I think it's probably doing the same thing, but we've had very difficult time proving that in humans, uh, simply because it's so hard to detect. Are toxin. there toxin receptors in the heart and in the lung? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't <laughs> know the answer to that. <laughs> I, I, I would assume. Anybody...